Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to For Freedom, For Union and Freedom, African Americans in the Civil War, an online professional development seminar for North Carolina teachers from America in class from the National Humanities Center. This uh, seminar is made possible by a grant from the Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation. I'm Richard Tram. I'm the Vice President for Education Programs here at the Humanities Center, and I'll be moderating this morning's session. Before we get underway, let me just take a brief moment to introduce the National Humanities Center. Many of you are familiar with the center because you've been in our seminars before, but we have some new people, so let me just take a minute to tell you that the National Humanities Center is located in Research Triangle Park. It is the country's only independent institute for advanced study in all branches of the humanities. That means that we're a private nonprofit organization, that the main program we run here is a fellowship program that brings scholars from this country and abroad to the center, usually for an academic year, to research and write on topics like history, literature and language studies, philosophy, criticism of the arts, that sort of thing. We opened in 1978. Since then, about 1,300 scholars have worked here, and they have produced about 1,300 books. The place may seem like an ivory tower, and that picture makes it look like an ivory tower, but it's not. The founders of the institution wanted us to connect with a wide array of audiences, and they were especially interested in having us connect with teachers, and we do that in a variety of ways. I'm not going to go into great detail about how we do that. Let me just invite you to click on americainclass.org. That will take you to this landing page, and from there you will be able to get to all of the resources the National Humanities Center provides teachers. Let me do point out one resource, though, for you, our fall 2012 schedule of online seminars. Uh, these seminars that we offer during the summer are exclusively for North Carolina teachers, but our seminars during the year are for teachers throughout the United States. You see the topics we're offering for fall 2012. Uh, if you're interested in any of those, please sign up. You can simply go to americainclass.org, and uh, from there go to seminars, and you'll get to our index page, and you'll be able to register. Please tell your uh, literary colleagues, your English teacher friends, that we're integrating English, more literary topics into our seminars, and uh, we think they'll be very interested in those, and they'll be uh, useful seminars for them as well. Uh, as we move into our seminar year, we're going to be emphasizing the Common Core standards in all of our seminars, so please pass that along to your colleagues as well. Now, at the end of this seminar, you can go to the For Union and Freedom webpage, from which you obtain the readings for this seminar, and there you will, you will find a recording of this seminar along with the PowerPoint presentation. We invite you to plunder the PowerPoint, use the slides for your uh, own classroom instruction. On that page, you will also find an evaluation form that you can complete and submit online. We ask you to do that. It's very important to us. We pay attention to what you say in those evaluations, and we try to improve our seminars on the basis of them. Once we receive your evaluation, we will send you a letter that you'll be able to present to your local certifying authority to get whatever recertification credit this seminar warrants. Now, here's how the seminar is going to work. We're going to be talking about various texts uh, today and various points about African-American uh, uh, service in the, uh, the Union Army and, and other ways that the African-Americans uh, played a role in the Civil War. Uh, we'll be stopping from time to time to analyze text and pose questions. You can respond uh, to those questions, and you can raise your own questions by putting your cursor in the box uh, that I have indicated there in green in the lower part of the screen. Uh, type your message in, click send, that button to the right, and your message will appear in the large chat box above. I will be paying attention to the chat and bringing it into the conversation at appropriate times. Now, I did mention that our seminars are, are linking more closely to the Common Core Standards, and I just wanted to point out how this particular seminar is going to link to them. We will be doing close reading of several texts. Um, they will be informational texts. That term should be familiar to you by now if you're familiar with the Common Core. We're going to be looking at letters, testimony, and reports. We're going to be looking at one persuasive text, a petition, and we'll also be doing some image analysis. And we're going to be looking at... Um, Three kinds of questions, not on every text, but uh, these are the kind of questions that you would probably, that you would indeed ask in the class if you were doing the kind of close reading that the Common Core requires. You'd be asking broad contextualizing questions, general analytical questions, and text-specific questions. And we'll offer you some examples of those three types. So contextualizing, 
Obviously, you'd ask what kind of text we're dealing with, when was it written, who wrote it, the audience, the purpose, that sort of thing. Analytical questions that you could ask of any text. What inferences can we draw from it? What's implied, not stated, what is omitted, what words are repeated, so on. And then throughout the seminar, you will see examples of text-specific questions uh, that uh, we have included uh, with many of our texts. So let's get underway. You posed some really good questions in the seminar forum, and we will be able to address all of these questions in our presentation today. What factors prompted the Union to employ African-American troops in the war? What factors prompted the Confederacy to approve the use of African-American troops? How decisive a role did African-Americans play in the Union victory? In other words, were African-American efforts on behalf of the North a big deal? To what extent did African-Americans, free or enslaved, fight for the Confederacy? How did the Union Army respond to the many escaped slaves who sought refuge within its lines? What specific impacts did African-American participation have on the course and outcome of the war? Uh, our essential understanding, the, the takeaway that we hope you'll bring back to your classes in our seminar, from our seminar this morning, is this. By undermining the Confederacy and aiding the Union, enslaved African-Americans played vital roles in destroying slavery during the Civil War. Now, to help us reach that understanding and to show, how, show us how we might be able to do that through the variety of texts that we have today, we are very pleased to have with us Leslie Rowland, a professor of history at the University of Maryland. She has written many books there on the screen there, uh, many articles, too many to put on one slide. So we've got a lot of uh, material to cover, so let me turn it over to Leslie right now. Let me just find her name on, on my list here, and I will make her the presenter, and Leslie will be able to lead us through for Union and Freedom. Leslie, the program is all yours. All Take right. Take it away. Are you hearing me? Yes, I okay, am. I hope everyone else is. Yeah. Well, welcome to everyone. I'm glad to be with you uh, today. And we've prepared a lot of material to cover, so we'll just plunge right in. And please do ask questions uh, in the chat box as they come up, and Richard will share them with me. Um, we're going to uh, many of your questions dealt directly with black soldiers, but we're in fact going to be discussing uh, in, in even more broad terms the role that African Americans played in the Civil War. So here are some of the, the ways that African Americans fought the Civil War, fought in quotation marks, how they uh, undermined the Confederacy and aided the Union in the Civil War. And we'll have documents that illustrate all of these points, but let's run through them quickly. Um, African American slaves enslaved African Americans in very large numbers, escaped from their owners, which denied the Confederacy valuable economic resources, especially their labor. Uh, because slaves knew their territory, they made excellent guides for Union troops for the same reasons they made excellent spies. Many of those who escaped returned to liberate uh, other slaves, their own families <clears throat> and others. Um, slaves deep within the Confederacy who had no opportunity to escape to Union military lines, aided escaped Union POWs, and also helped Confederate deserters. Uh, African Americans became soldiers and sailors, actively taking up arms against the Confederacy. Uh, we'll see examples of the courage and ingenuity and loyalty that they demonstrated, often at great um, personal risk, and some of the psychological transformations that they experience in the course of uh, fighting, acting against the Union and aiding the Confederacy. And we'll also see evidence of the way that their uh, actions changed Union policy, which initially was not to end slavery at all. Um, the way their actions influenced Union policy and uh, affected the, a shift to um, the war being against slavery as well as to restore the Union. So those will be some of the topics we'll be discussing. Let's begin with the beginning, which was what seems like a individual, number of individual decisions to flee owners and go to Union lines. Here's one beautiful example of a slave in Maryland named John Boston, who wrote this letter to his wife after he had successfully escaped from uh, slavery and was now with a Union regiment in 
um, Virginia. So John Boston wrote, and I think if you use this document with your students, it helps convey the the uh, wrenching personal decision that's often involved was often involved in fleeing to union lines. Here's what John Boston writes. Oh, I should say first, when I use this document with my students, I point out to them that here's a letter that's written by someone who clearly has relatively little, uh, probably no formal education. And you'll notice that in, in the letter, there's not a single mark of punctuation. Spelling is entirely irregular. But if you read it aloud, you hear in it the cadences of the King James Bible. You realize you're here listening to someone who's the product of a largely oral culture where storytelling is valued. So let me read this letter. My dear wife, it is with great joy I take this time to let you know where I am. I am now in safety in the 14th Regiment of Brooklyn. This day, I can address you, thank God, as a free man. I had a little trouble in getting away, but as the Lord led the children of Israel to the land of Canaan, so he led me to a land where freedom will reign in spite of earth and hell. Dear, you must make yourself content. I am free from all the slaver's lash. I'm with a very nice man and have all that heart can wish, but my dear, I can't express my great desire that I have to see you. I trust the time will come when we shall meet again, and if we don't meet on earth, we will meet in heaven where Jesus reigns. I want you to write to me as soon as, as, soon as you can without delay. Direct your letter to the 14th Regiment, New York State Militia, Uptons Hill, Virginia, in care of Mr. Cranford Comery. Kiss Daniel for me. Give my love to father and mother. And now in this letter, of course, helps illustrate a, a fugitive slave who's fled to Union lines. Um, but we can ask a number of other questions uh, with about this. One is the personal cost at which he'd done so. That is, the earliest fugitives were uh, mostly single men or men who had to leave their families because it was very uncertain what reception they would receive in union lines. Um, so they often fled first. Um, we need to ask what your students will be puzzled, perhaps, when J John Boston says he was with a very nice man in the New York State Militia. What do you, uh, what would you assume that means? Um, while you're thinking about that, you might, a larger question is to think about the cumulat cumulative effect of individual decisions like John Boston's. How would this decision to flee to an unknown reception in Union uh, lines affect the transformation of Union war aims. Remember that at this time, um, slavery, ending slavery was not a goal of the Union. Formal Union policy was that Union troops were not to accept fugitive slaves. So let me hear some of your thoughts about, about okay. these questions. We have one response mm -hmm. um, that uh, John Boston was probably the manservant, or maybe he was under the command of, uh, of a man. Mm -hmm. um, Cranford could be the leader of his division. Uh, so I think people are saying that, that he was you know, serving someone uh, in the Union Army. I think um, that's probably right, that he, uh, this Cranford Comery must have taken him on as a personal servant. And that's often how the first fugitive slaves were accepted into Union lines by individual soldiers who, in defiance of formal policy, um, said, oh, if you'll help me, if you'll cook for me or tend my horse, be my personal servant, um, they would protect them. Mm -hmm. Another participant adds something here that's really important to keep in mind as you're dealing with these sorts of documents. There's really no way of determining the precise nature of their relationship. We're inferring, we're surmising here. But it seems mm -hmm. to be a safe surmise, wouldn't you say? It's safe, especially because other documents make it clear that at this point, uh, fugitive slaves are not being yet formally employed by the Union Army. They certainly weren't being enlisted. So in some ways, the surmise comes by eliminating those possibilities were not open. And we also have other documents from Union soldiers themselves who talk about the arrival of fugitive slaves and hiring one, hiring one of them as servants. So they provide the other side of John Boston's experience. 
Let you, make a, you, make, you, make, excuse me, you make a good point there about corroborating documents mm -hmm. with others by bouncing them off others. We do need a point of clarification, though. Uh, John Boston did not become a slave again when he was in the Union lines, right? Uh, he was now, at this point, he was, well, for all practical purposes, he was free, right? Yeah. He, he's not yet entitled to legal freedom. These early fugitive slaves had no legal claim to freedom, but they had escaped their masters, and to the extent that the Union troops they were with would protect them, they were free from slavery. But it is important to note that it's not yet that they have any formal legal claim to freedom, and that was another important step. Um, but the, the uh, fugitive slaves who were taken on by Union soldiers as personal servants uh, were paid uh, wages, or at least were provided with food and clothing. They had to work out an, an initial deal, uh, a, a particular deal. But in effect, they're engaging in free labor for um, um, labor as free people with a, a particular person who hires them. Right. Uh, Leslie, we have a 21st century comment from a participant. <laughs> The writing is hauntingly familiar to texting conversations between students. Oh, very interesting. <laughs> you mean the bad spelling? <laughs> I guess the spelling and the lack of punctuation and the, yes. kind, of, you know, the kind of raw way in which it's written. Well, that was stuff. one teacher once suggested to me, I've never done this with my students, that uh, in, an, in a, an English class, one thing you could do with this document would be to have the students write the same letter but with correct spelling and punctuation to test their own spelling and punctuation. <laughs> one question, one thing I wanted to point out, my students often ask me, um, why in the world would this man run away and leave his wife in slavery? And one point to make first is that we in fact don't know whether she was a, a slave or a free woman. Um, and because she was in Maryland, that's an especially big question, because in Maryland, at the time of the Civil War, almost half of the people of African descent in Maryland were free, not enslaved. So she may have been free while he was a slave. The other possibility is that they both were slaves, but in Maryland, most slave holdings were very small, and many, perhaps probably most, slave couples were owned by different owners. So they may not have even lived on the same place. But the third point is that early in the war, when the reception of fugitive slaves in Union lines was entirely uncertain, um, most uh, escaped slaves were men because the Union Army wasn't well, ready to welcome women and children. They, they weren't ready to employ them the way they did the men. So again, this is all surmise, but uh, if students do ask about that, uh, that will give you some uh, some responses you might use. The letter, well, before mm -hmm. we move on, there's an important comment here. One mm -hmm. participant notes that the letter also tells us that John Boston wanted more for himself and his family. And I think this, the fact that he ran away shows that he had greater aspirations and ambitions. And the fact that he, he could dictate or perhaps right, a letter like this also shows that, mm -hmm. that he was perhaps more educated than, yes. than mm -hmm. the average, mm -hmm. average slave. It seems unlikely very formal education, but maybe it had been taught by another, another uh, either black or white person who had literacy. He certainly picked up uh, a good bit along the way. Now, we could do a lot more, but I'm afraid we probably ought to move on. Yes, let's move ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, so that, that document John Boston gave us, here's kind of the opening episode in what slaves, uh, slaves running away to Union lines. Here's an opening document that introduces us to slaves who were deep within the Confederacy, not near enough to Union lines to flee easily, but the way that their actions began to undermine the Confederacy. This is testimony given by a former slave in 1873 before an outfit called the Southern Claims Commission. We're going to see a later document about testimony before it, too. This was a commission formed after the war to entertain by the federal government to entertain claims by, white union, by unionists, black or white, in the South who had lost property as a result uh, of the Union Army activities. So to, to establish a claim, a claimant had to prove that he or she had been loyal to the Union throughout the war. 
and that they had owned property that had been damaged by Union forces. So much to the surprise of the commissioners, when they began to hear testimony, a good many claimants were black. They weren't prepared for the fact that there would be uh, black Southerners who had lost property to the Union Army. But one of these claimants was Samuel Elliott. So he testifies, since they have to demonstrate their loyalty, here's, the, here's how he testified about his loyalty to the Union. He said, my name is Samuel Elliott. I was born in Liberty County, a slave. I belong to Maybank Jones, who, by the way, is a big slave owner, owned uh, uh, hundreds of slaves. I was with my owner as a waiter in the rebel service. Now, by waiter, he means a personal servant, not a waiter as in a restaurant. It means he was the, the body servant of his master. I was with him 11 months. I came home with him. I told my son what was going on. He, with 11 more, ran off and joined the army, the Yankee army on St. Catherine Island. I don't remember the year, but it was soon after the battle at Williamsburg, Virginia, and before the Seven Days Battle near Chickahominy. That places it in uh, either May or June of 1862. Uh, my master had me taken up, tied me, and tried to make me tell what made them run off. I had to lie about it to keep from getting killed. That stopped the slave owners from sending or taking slaves into the army as waiters or anything else. It stopped it in our neighborhood. So here's a document that shows some of the ways that the Confederacy tried to mobilize uh, slave labor on behalf of the Confederacy, in this case, taking a personal servant into the army. I'll just note here that the Confederacy mobilized slaves on behalf of the Confederate cause in all kinds of ways. Uh, every Confederate uh, army unit had black teamsters, black cooks, black nurses, black laundresses. Uh, slaves were also employed in Confederate factories on railroads, and so on. They were not uh, uh, enlisted as soldiers. I know in the, the forum in advance, some of you asked about black Confederate soldiers. Not until the final month of the war did the Confederacy authorize the use of black, uh, black men as soldiers. But the Confederacy was a slave society. It's dependent on slave labor in peacetime, and it expected to depend on slave labor in wartime. So, um, Samuel Elliott's a little example of uh, use of slave labor with the Confederate Army. But look what happened. His master took him with him into the Army. He's up in Virginia. They go from, from Georgia up to Virginia. And while he's there, he learns, as he put it, what's going on. He learns what was going on. So when his master was either discharged or gone home on furlough, we don't know which, uh, and brought Samuel Elliott home with him, Samuel Elliott told the other slaves what was going on, that is, that it was possible to escape to Union lines and receive a welcome reception. And with that news, his own son and 11 more enslaved men ran off to St. Catherine Island and probably uh, got access to a Union gunboat because the, the Union uh, ships were patrolling that area. So this is a good example to address the question about how uh, slaves took advantage of Confederate mobilization to undermine slavery. The Confederates thought they could use slaves to strengthen their cause, but some slaves who were taken into service uh, near or close to Union, uh, Confederate armies learned of uh, Union policy and use that knowledge to act against the war. Um, so a good question to ask is how this letter illustrates a point of vulnerability for the Confederacy. Is, could they count on the loyalty of the slaves that they mobilized in support of the Confederate war effort? Samuel Elliott's testimony suggests not. Leslie, uh, a question that will inevitably come up if teachers mm -hmm. use this text in class, <clears throat> do we know if Samuel Elliott willingly served his master in the Confederate Army, or was he coerced? Well, he was a slave, and so he had to do what his master told told him to do. I mean, he's taken, just as he, he probably was his master's body servant at home, and so when his master went to the army, he took him. But Samuel Elliott didn't have a choice in that matter. That is, that was his, he's assigned to do that by his owner. And he may have deeply resented it because it, 
clearly separated him from his family. But my guess is that he was probably um, Maybank Jones's personal servant uh, at home, and Jones just took him with him into the army. Okay, well, shall we move on then? Yes. Okay. All right, now we shift to the Union again, and I want to use this document to suggest something about the effect of uh, slaves on, devel on the changes in Union policy. We saw John Boston running away early. So here's, here's a document that helps illustrate what the arrival of many John Bostons in Union lines, how it began to affect, affect Union policy with respect to uh, slavery. Richard, do you want to read this one so they don't have to listen to me every single minute? Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. I am directed by General Doubleday to say in answer to your letter of the second instant that all Negroes coming into the lines of any of the camps or forts under his command are to be treated as persons and not as chattels. The question has been asked whether it would not be better to exclude Negroes altogether from the lines. The general is of the opinion that they bring much valuable information which cannot be obtained from any other source. They are acquainted with all the roads, paths, fords, and other natural features of the country, and they make excellent guides. They also know and frequently have exposed the haunts of secession spies and traitors and the existence of rebel organizations. They will not, therefore, be excluded. Now, at the time this letter was written, Official Union policy, the policy announced by the War Department, sent to all the troops, was, and announced to the general public, was that the war was being fought only to restore the Union, had nothing to do with slavery, and Union forces were under instructions to exclude fugitive slaves from their lines, not to admit fugitive slaves. So here's a general telling his subordinates, in effect, to ignore that policy because of the value, the value of uh, the information that fugitive slaves bring to the Union forces. So this can help your students begin to see the contributions that fugitive slaves could make to the Union uh, forces and how Union troops came to value that information enough to say fugitive slaves who arrived should be treated not as slaves but as persons. Um, and when you think about it, like they bring much valuable information. That information, of course, as the document points out, is about roads, how do you ford a particular river, um, and that meant they could ask as good, act as good guides. But that information is also about who in this vicinity is loyal, who are leading Confederates, where are weapons stored, how far away are for Union troops. And in this case, he points out they've exposed secession spies and traitors. Um, and so essentially, here's a general saying, we can't afford to exclude these people. They bring valuable military uh, information. So I think you can, be, you can help your students begin to see how that, the value of the escaped slaves to the Union forces begins to shift attitudes about what policy towards slavery should be. Any questions about that? I don't think so. I think okay, people really enjoy on. this document. I think it's going to be used in some classes. So okay, let's do that. that's what I like to hear. All right, this next document is far too long for us to read in whole, but it is an extraordinary document that I've used very successfully with my students at, to get them to actively engage the document and uh, enumerate a list of the different ways that slaves who escaped the Confederacy into Union military lines could help the Union. This is testimony, or really a report, by a guy who had been in charge of newly arrived slaves in, Nor oh, because you're all from North Carolina, this would be even more valuable, uh, in Union-occupied North Carolina. Uh, primarily, in, he's appointed right when the Union troops first occupy New Bern, in the area around New Bern. So he's talking about March through July of 1862. He's giving the testimony a, a year later. But he's talking about the, those first four months after Union occupation. Now, the Union troops had occupied uh, Albemarle Sound and Pamlico Sound. So uh, New Bern, Washington, Plymouth, that's the part of North Carolina under Union occupation. 
And that's really all of North Carolina that the Union troops took until the very last year of the war. So any North Carolina slaves who wanted to escape the Union lines had to get to that um, part of just Tidewater, uh, North Carolina. So Vincent Collier was in charge of the escaped slaves. And he, in this report, enumerates the different uh, ways that uh, fugitive slaves aided the Union. So we've highlighted some of the points. I think you'd want to look at it with more care, but this one, the students have to read the documents carefully in order to identify the service, but it's very rich. They contributed to building forts. They loaded and discharged cargoes from more than about 300 ships. They served on crews of steamers that operated in the sounds. They acted as gangs of laborers in all the different army departments. Quartermasters deal with uh, supplies, commissary or the, the food ordinance or weaponry. So they're the laborers in all those departments of the army. A number of them were artisans, had artisan skills, carpenters, blacksmiths, coopers, and so on. And they worked uh, constructing ships and other tasks of, that required skilled labor. Uh, this is really a remarkable paragraph. Um, about 50 of them, uh, a few more than 50, he says, of the best and most courageous were kept constantly employed in the duty of being spies, scouts, and guides. <clears throat> and this, I've sometimes had my students get a map and look at where what this would mean. He says that in that work, they frequently went from, from 30 to 300 miles within Confederate lines and would um, spy on Confederate forces, find out how well equipped they were, where they were exa exactly. And they visited Kingston, Goldsboro, Trenton. You could see what you could do with a map here. Um, on these errands, they often barely escaped with their lives. They're pursued on several occasions by bloodhounds. Two or three of them are taken prisoners. One was shot. The fate of the others wasn't known. Um, they're paid for all this work and all the other work we just talked about. He said early on that they received eight, the men received eight dollars a month for their work. They seemed to think their lives were well spent, if necessary, in giving rest, security, and success to the Union troops, whom they regarded as their deliverers. And then this poignant line, before they left on these dangerous missions, they knelt in solemn prayer, and then on their return, uh, again, they knelt, knelt in prayer. Um, the women and children supported themselves with very little aid from the government by washing, ironing, cooking, making pies and cakes for the troops. The, only a few women were employed by uh, the government, and mostly in hospitals, and they received $4 a month. Then this line tells you about the devotion with which uh, escaped slaves turned their services to the Union cause. They considered it a duty to work for the U.S. government, and though they could in many cases have made more money at other conditions, there was a public opinion among them that tabooed anyone who refuses to work for the government. So there's sort of social ostracism among escaped slaves if you didn't work to support the Union. Uh, the men also led foraging parties uh, to get supplies. There's some details there. Oh, and it ended, I'm sorry, the last line points out that um, without doubt, they recovered property from the Confederates that was more worth more than all the wages that were paid to them. So their efforts also paid for themselves, even just in dollar and cent terms. Um, now, where were, let's see, the, que the questions, let me go back to that. Um, so the analytical questions you could ask, of course, would be to identify the various ways that slaves uh, aided the Union military effort and the risks of doing so. But it's also important to point out to your students that this testimony is about events in the first half of 1862, before emancipation was an aim of the war. And so then you can ask them to generalize from this document to think about how these actions and similar actions in all the other theaters of the war would have influenced the development of Union policy towards slavery. Leslie, we had a, a comment here mm -hmm. that indicated that these 
the, the uh, enslaved who came to the lines were paid for their work and therefore mm -hmm. they were not slaves. But that's really not the issue. I mean, the, the enslaved who are coming to the union lines are doing this work because they want to. Even if they weren't paid, they were doing it of their own free will. So Absolutely. That, that's mm -hmm. the critical part that separates mm -hmm. them from being enslaved in the South and then being um, not legally free, but free at this point behind union lines. Exactly. And when he points out, for example, that some of them could have made money, more money doing other jobs, but chose to work for the government, uh, tells you that, that uh, they're choosing how to use their labor, how to devote their time and energy. Uh, and growing numbers of escaped slaves were employed by the Union Army in all of these various roles. That is, their, imp their importance as military laborers and in all kinds of military support roles was just mushrooming in the first half of 1862. And it did have a big impact on uh, Union policy towards slavery. I mean, daily, escaped slaves are demonstrating their value to the Union. All right. Shall we move ahead? All right. Now we can shift back. So what's going on on the Union side is uh, escaped slaves making ever greater contributions to the Union cause, not yet as soldiers, but in all kinds of support roles. How did the Confederates respond to this large volume of escaped slaves? What was their policy toward uh, fugitive slaves. And this is a, a letter from a Confederate, the commander of a Confederate cavalry battalion to his superiors, a con the, his Confederate superiors, written from Oklahoma, Mississippi in early 1863. Now notice this date. This is just after the issue of the Emancipation Proclamation. So this is at the moment that the Union has now announced that its policy does include destroying slavery. Ending slavery is now an aim of the Union war effort. Um, Oklahoma is about um, 50 miles from Corinth, Mississippi, which had been held by Union forces since the spring of 1862, and a large um, contraband camp. Contraband was the name Union forces used for escaped slaves. They'd been declared contraband of war and could be put to the purposes of the Union, a large contraband camp. So here's, here's uh, Confederate forces encountered slaves who had escaped to Corinth, and now, after the Emancipation Proclamation, they are going back to their old homes to tell other slaves about the Emancipation policy and to help them escape. And some of these slaves, it's very dangerous to do this. These uh, former slaves who are now going back home to try to uh, spread the word of emancipation to others and rescue them, some of them were uh, taken by Confederate troops. And this Confederate commander is writing to say, what should we do with such slaves? So you will oblige me by sending instructions in reference to the matter of disposing of Negroes, runaways, caught by my scouts, and not giving correct statement of the names of their owners and residents. Their number is increasing beyond convenience. They're asking for the names of their owners, of course, so that they could return them to their owners. On yesterday, a Negro was caught, armed, and killed two dogs in the attempt to catch him, and finally shot himself, inflicting a severe wound, after which he stated that he was from Corinth. And on the night of the first instant, the Negroes, or most of them, were assembled at that place, and officers attended making lectures and stating they were free. The Negroes, after receiving each a pistol, a six-shooter, were instructed to go to the vicinity of their respective homes and act as missionaries or in the recruiting service. I wish to know how to deal with them when caught. So one thing that students are really impressed by is the extent to which the guy they caught tried to prevent being caught, to resist being caught. He killed two dogs trying, that were catching him. And then rather than be caught, he tried to shoot himself. Um, but evidently he inflicted a severe wound but survived. So the Confederate commander wants to know, what should we do with these former slaves who are now trying to go back and help liberate others? And the response from department headquarters, we've just summarized there at the bottom, the response was pretty stark. 
said, when you take Negroes with arms, evidently coming out from the enemy's camp, proceed at once to hold a drumhead court-martial, and if found guilty, hang them upon the spot. A drumhead court-martial just meant an informal hearing right there in the field. So essentially the, the instructions are, when you catch people who've escaped and they're on their way back to liberate others, hang them. That's the Confederate policy. Um, now, one thing you can do with this document is um, to ask directly what's Confederate policy about fugitive slaves, and um, also, of course, about the risks that slaves who went back to liberate others, the risks they face. And um, we can also use this to compare with Union policy at the time. And here, we've uh, Richard has prepared a slide that puts side by side these last two documents we've looked at. And you might ask your students to compare Union policy toward escaped slaves with that of the Confederacy. So the Union policy is increasingly to welcome them, make use of their the information they bring the Confederate policy is um, to return them to slavery or uh, to hang them, hang them on the spot. Hey, let's say a point of clarification. Mm -hmm. The Union policy of accepting um, the enslaved into their lines predated the Emancipation Proclamation, right? Yes. Now, early on, when John Boston fled, Union policy was that you're supposed to exclude them. And actually, the exclusion policy is still in, po in place in April 1862, when the letter on the left was written. But the formal legal moment that the exclusion policy is done away with was in July 1862, when Congress passed the Second Confiscation Act and the Militia Act. And both of those laws had provisions authorizing the reception of fugitive slaves and their employment in support roles for the Union Army, and it specified that they would be paid. Up until that time, commanders who accepted them and used them, as they almost all did, were technically violating um, the policy. Um, but that tells you something about how useful the fugitives were to these troops on the ground. In, in many respects, the troops on the ground discovered before the big policymakers did that they were not going to be able to restore the Union without moving against slavery, that the resources the slaves were offering were simply too valuable. And those on-the-ground experiences are part of what moved Congress to make it official policy that the Union now was going to employ all fugitive slaves who wanted to work for the Union and that they would be paid and protected and forever free. That language is in the, in the legislation. Okay, well, shall we move on okay. then? Okay, all right. <coughs> now, this is testimony <clears throat> by another union officer who, he was in charge of uh, superintendent of contrabands, in charge of fugitive slaves at Fortress Monroe, Virginia. Fortress Monroe is at the very tip of the peninsula between the York and James River in Virginia. And he's testifying um, in 1863 but he's been in charge uh, since 1862. So he's, uh, March 1862 is when he had become the superintendent of contrabands. So he's describing um, the arrival of fugitive slaves at Fortress and Row. Now this one is too lengthy to read in whole, but again, you could use this with students to, uh, for close reading of the document to get the details about um, what fugitive slaves did and how they arrived. But this one also provides really valuable information about how slaves learned about union policy, the ways they sometimes sent. Some people would flee to union lines to find out what was what and then go back to tell others. Also, it's very interesting to notice the long distances they came. Many of the slave, fugitive slaves who came to Fortress Monroe came from North Carolina. So you could also use, uh, use that in emphasizing North Carolina history. So he says, this was the rendezvous. Slaves came here from all about, from Richmond and 200 miles off in North Carolina. If you get a map, you notice that, that many of those North Carolina slaves were having to come through the Great Dismal Swamp, which was no picnic, I'll tell you. Um, 
So then uh, the commission before which he's testifying had been created by the War Department after the Emancipation Proclamation to make plans for now that emancipation was union, announced union policy, what policy should be adopted with respect to uh, fugitive slaves and um, the Emancipation Proclamation and also said that black men would be recruited as soldiers. So this was a commission designed to develop policy for black recruitment and for the treatment of slaves who came into union lines. So one of the things the commissioners ask is, was is there any communication between the refugees, that is the escaped slaves, and the uh, enslaved people uh, still in slavery? And he answers, yes, we've had men here who've gone back 200 miles. Um, and look at some of the highlighted parts here. Here he, he quotes some particular individuals who says, I'm going back again after my wife when I've earned a little money. Uh, I'm going for my family, they say. And he's asked, they ask, Are, aren't you afraid to go back? He said, no, I know the way. Colored men will help colored men and they'll work along the bypaths and get through. Um, and he's, uh, Wilder is saying they don't feel afraid now. The white people are nearly all gone. The bloodhounds aren't there now to hunt them. And they're not afraid. Before they were afraid to stir. Um, now, the conclusion of this has a very disturbing passage that is an important reminder <coughs> that even once it was union policy to liberate slaves, um, not all Northerners um, agreed with this policy. Many Northern soldiers were not anti-slavery, or even if they were, they were also opportunistic. And so here we have a case where uh, a new, the men in a New York regiment were actually um, catching fugitives and selling them to the Confederates, getting paid for it. Um, within the last two or three months, the rebel guards have been doubled on the line, and the officers and privates of the 99th New York between Norfolk and Suffolk have caught hundreds of fugitives and got paid for them. Now, the commissioners who are hearing this testimony are shocked, and they say, do I understand you to say that a great many who have escaped have been sent back? And Wilder answers, yes, sir. The masters will come into Suffolk in the daytime, and with the help of some of the 99th, carry off their fugitives, and by and by smuggle them across the line, and the soldier will get his $20 or $50. So this is a reminder that Northerners are not uniformly anti-slavery, and certainly not uniformly sympathetic. Uh, to the escaped slaves. Um, some of you may know that um, a big effort is underway to make Fortress Monroe in Virginia a, a historic site. Um, and there's now a good deal of information on the web uh, about uh, Fortress Monroe, both as the place where Africans were first landed as slaves, and then for its role during the Civil War as one of the first destinations for fugitive slaves. And it's the location where that circumlocution contrabands of war was first used. Fugitive slaves were dubbed contrabands of war by Benjamin Butler, who was in command at Fortress Monroe. Okay, shall we move on? Now this slide, <clears throat> let me interject, this sure. we just mm -hmm. put in in case the teachers want to use Wilder's testimony. It is a very long piece, but I think it could be used usefully. And we offer these questions as a way to get into a close reading of that testimony. So again, please plunder the PowerPoint, take these slides back and use them in your classes. So we could move up, move ahead then. Let's okay. Good. All right, now here we have an image that um, helps um, visualize the processes we've been talking about. That this was published in Harper's Weekly, a northern um, magazine, sort of it's newspaper format, but it's like a magazine, in February 1863. And its caption is, the effects of the proclamation, meaning the Emancipation Proclamation, freed slaves coming into our lines at New Bern, North Carolina. Again, for North, has a nice North Carolina theme here. So what can we learn from this image about emancipation? While you're thinking about that and sending some of your comments, let me point out one of the most obvious one is look at the numbers of people arriving with Union troops. This is probably a Union foraging expedition that's gone out, and they're coming back with all of these slaves. 
every one of these slaves represents important labor that the Confederacy was counting on using to raise food for both civilians and the army. So this long line of fugitive slaves coming in with, um, uh, with Union troops represents a huge deduction of valuable labor from the Confederacy. What other thoughts do you have about this image? Now, one participant has noted they're leaving in droves, which echoes your point, mm -hmm. and that that is important. They're taking an enormous amount of labor. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> what else do we see? Um, what, what, we have some good questions there. What about the funnel-like structure of the uh, of the uh, drawing? I mean, it, it gives a sense of people just pouring out of the countryside. Anything else? What about the oxen driver's whip? The, the guy standing to the to the right of the oxen. Any any um, symbolic value there? Do you think that you could point out to mm -hmm. your students? Whose hand is the whip in now? Yes, very good point. Yeah. And I think the military, the, the, the way they've, um, yeah, seems some level of pride and then the way the kind of the, the, the people in the front have that kind of military step, the military cadence to mm -hmm. their walking. Yeah, that also mm -hmm. underscores the level of pride that one of our participants. Look at that guy right in the middle who's, you see, he's, this is like, this is a man who's, he's marching with uh, confidence, pride, excitement, marching into a new future. This is like a, a sense these aren't people just being driven away from slavery. They're also going to something, expecting a new, a new future. We have a question here. Is there any documentation concerning the actual numbers of African Americans who left following the proclamation? Um, I don't think I'd be able to break it down by timing, but a, here's one kind of rough estimate, is that at minimum, at least 500,000, half a million, slaves fled into Union military lines during the Civil War. The reason I say at least is that the, 500, the half a million is the number who were employed by the Union Army, who were either enlisted as soldiers or worked as military laborers. Um, we can tote them up from various reports, and they come to half a million. Now, there were other fugitive slaves who didn't necessarily work for the Union Army who came, so half a million is the minimum. But uh, that's the that's the best estimate that historians have made to date. We have a comment here. Uh, this could be used to illustrate government's use of propaganda during the war. This isn't actually a government-produced picture. This was produced mm -hmm. by a, 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 yeah. uh, the Harper's Weekly, which was not a, a government publication. So this really isn't uh, government uh, propaganda. Right. We have one other person who's raised an issue, that, uh, a point in the picture that I've never seen. The clouds are breaking up. So, oh, uh, that's yeah, a, great, a new dawn is a great coming. Point. Yeah. Um, one of the things I could have said at the beginning is that Harper's and some other, uh, Frank Leslie's Illustrated, too, they had artists who traveled with the armies and did uh, sketches, and then they sent them back to New York, and these engravings were made from their sketches. And I've seen um, not all the initial original sketches survive, but I've seen several of them and looked at them alongside the engravings. And the engravings do, uh, most of them just replicate the drawings. Mm -hmm. As I'd always wondered, did they doctor them up a lot for the, make them, you know, make them look, um, make points that weren't in the initial drawings. But the ones I've seen all were simply engravings of that drawing. So this was probably a first-hand observation by one, an artist uh, who was on retainer for Harper's mm -hmm. traveling with the Union Army. Mm -hmm. Another very good point of interpretation. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to see the freed slaves at the front of the line not being led by soldiers. Mm -hmm. Good yeah. point. And finally, one question about audience before we move on. How would readers of Harper's Weekly receive this picture? Oh, that's a very good question. We can only speculate, of course, but this is just after the Emancipation Proclamation. So one one conclusion they could draw from this is the Emancipation Proclamation is now encouraging even larger numbers of slaves to desert the Confederacy and come into Union lines, and that's a good thing because it's weakening the Confederacy. I mean, one of the, what I call the low road arguments to emancipation in the North had been, and it's offered by people who maybe um, are very racially prejudiced, not anti-slavery, 
but they come to see that um, weakening, using any method to weaken the Confederacy will help the Union cause. And so those those sorts of Northerners could look at this and say, oh, good, this is this will hasten the end of the war because it's encouraging slaves to desert the Confederacy. Uh, Northerners who are more anti-slavery, abolitionists, or people who are developing anti-slavery sentiments who hadn't been um, beforehand, they might uh, look at it the way I did of not only is this a subtraction of labor from the Confederacy, but they can now be used valuable labor for the Union. Some of these men might enlist in the Army. And that guy in the front who's looking toward a new future, they had ideas of now they're in union lines, the children can go to school, they can begin to work for wages, they can begin a new future in freedom. There's a, a couple of comments here uh, about uh, this picture potentially stirring fears in the north There'd be that there would be a great wave of migration that mm -hmm. would displace people from jobs there. Do you think that Absolutely. was uh, so that well, was especially the democrats Democratic Party in the north really encouraged that uh, that fear. So um, that commission I was talking about earlier appointed by the War Department, one of the things it was trying to do was uh, say, how can we make provision for these escaped slaves in freedom that would allow them to be free in the South and not come to the North? So there was a good deal of concern, both on the part of some people who didn't want them coming to the North, but also of policymakers that that fear would undermine support for the emancipation policy. So there's a lot of thinking by policymakers about um, uh, how can we uh, uh, establish modes of freedom, free labor, uh, allowing some people to cultivate land? Um, lots of reports coming in from uh, Union Occupied South also indicating that uh, ex-slaves actually were very attached to their old homes and weren't particularly interested in coming uh, to the North in large numbers. Uh, but I think that's a very good observation that for Anti, for people who were uh, opposed to the Union's emancipation policy, this picture might have created a fear of an influx, large influx mm -hmm. of black people into the North. Mm -hmm. Well, that would be a very good question to ask uh, when you're analyzing this question, the question about how, about how uh, various audiences in the North would respond to it. Mm -hmm. well, shall we move on then? Yes, yes, very good. Um, well, one thing I meant to say while we're looking at that is on the list of readings, we're not using it in the seminar today, but there is some testimony by an elderly ex-slave uh, who, as a child in North Carolina, escaped Union lines with her family. And because it's North Carolina in particular, some of you might want to use it. It's uh, toward the beginning of the reading list, um, but you might want to use it after talking about solitary escapes, it would be a great one. And it's told from the point of view of a child. So some of your students might identify with that. All right, here's, um, here's a document that allows us to uh, uh, address directly the activities which were widespread of those slaves who had escaped to Union lines in liberating other slaves. That is, the escaped slaves weren't satisfied simply with their own freedom, and they mounted efforts to rescue others. And this is about a rescue ex expedition mounted by black men who were employed as military laborers with the government. And they sought help from uh, the commander of a black regiment in uh, going into the interior to get their families and other families and friends who were still in slavery. And so this black commander, Edward Wilde, um, allows, sends uh, 15 enlisted men at, under the command of a captain to go with these black men to try to get their, get their families. Um, let, let's start in about the third sentence. It says, the families were in and about Smithfield. This is in Virginia. I gave them strict instructions to abstain from plundering, to injure no one if possible, to get the women and children merely and come away as promptly as possible. They were to land in the night. They use this to think about the kind of the dangers of these expeditions. They followed these directions closely, but became delayed by the numbers of women and children anxious to follow, 
whom they packed in extra boats, picked up there, and towed along. They also had to contend against a head tide and wind calm, so that their progress down Smithfield Creek in the early morn was exceedingly slow. The inhabitants, meaning the white inhabitants, evidently gathered in from some concerted plan of alarm or signals. For, three miles below, the party were intercepted by a force of irregular appearance, numbering about 100, having horses and dogs with them, armed variously with shotguns, rifles, etc., and posted behind old breastworks with some hurried additions. They attacked the leading boats, killed a man and a woman, and wounded another woman therein. The contrabands then rowed over to the opposite bank and scattered over the marshes. How many more have been slaughtered, we know not. So this is an important reminder that, that expeditions to liberate others often didn't succeed. Um, so here's a, and it's also a very good reminder about how, notice the date of this, this is in the final year of the war. And yet the local, white locals, uh, were able to muster an irregular defense force and clearly had concerted plans to intercept this uh, expedition, this rescue expedition, to kill several of them. Probably more were killed, but certainly they weren't rescued into freedom. They're scattered over the marshes. Who knows what became became of them? So it's, it's easy to kind of say escaped slaves went back to liberate others. This document will help remind, point out to students just how dangerous that was and that there was a quite serious risk of lack of success in uh, reaching Union lines successfully. I, mean, I think we need a point of clarification. I think the comment mm -hmm. we have here in the chat refers back perhaps to your comment about some Union soldiers when uh, an escaped slave would come to their lines, they would then sell them back to mm -hmm. the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. um, but one participant writes, so we can't say that Union equals freedom, Confederate, Confederacy equals slavery. It's teaching students a fallacy if we do. Um, how, how would you respond to that? Well, the first point to make is that, that the action of that New York regiment was um, highly unusual, and it was in violation of Union policy. So Union policy was that, that uh, slaves who escaped to, after 1863, uh, that after the Emancipation Proclamation, that they were free. So if fugitive slaves could get into Union lines successfully, uh, they were legally entitled to freedom, and increasingly Union forces enforced it. Now, that document's a reminder that some Union troops weren't in sympathy with that. But formal policy, yes, was freedom, whereas formal Confederate policy absolutely was slavery. So the, um, the legal policies and the policies being enforced uh, are freedom for the Union after the Emancipation Proclamation, not initially and slavery in the Confederacy throughout. But we do need, you know, even today, people, a policy may be adopted and not all people uh, agree with the policy and may not, uh, may not fully uh, accord it. So I think you can use that document about the personal sentiments of not all Northerners are not anti-slavery. But the important point to help your students see is that even Northerners who weren't particularly anti-slavery uh, most of them came to see emancipation as a valuable tool to, for Union victory. So many of them who weren't initially anti-slavery came to oppose slavery or to favor emancipation because they, even if they simply concluded that the Union couldn't be victorious without uh, attacking slavery. Okay, and we have further points of clarification on that. Mm -hmm. um, after uh, 1863, slaves who made it to Union lines were legally free, but you still had slavery in some northern states, right? Yes, the Union, the border states, a uh, very important observation. The Emancipation Proclamation had nothing to do with, it had to do with slaves that the states that had seceded from the Union. So it had nothing at all to do with the slave states that had stayed in the Union. That is Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri. And so slaves in those states did not gain freedom as a result of the emancipation. Now, the story of how slavery was ended in each of those states is a little different from each other. 
but both Maryland and Missouri ended slavery by state action during the war. Maryland in October 1864, Missouri in January 1865. But neither Delaware nor Kentucky ended slavery at all during the war. So when the Civil War ended, slavery was still legal in Delaware and in Kentucky. We're going to see, we have some documents coming up about Kentucky that will show that, however, enlistment of black soldiers in Kentucky played an enormous role in undermining slavery, even though it continued to have legal existence, because soldiers became free. And then in March 1865, Congress passed a joint resolution freeing the wives and children of black soldiers as well. Mm -hmm. And so in Kentucky, um, because the Emancipation Proclamation didn't affect slavery there, uh, black military service played an enormous role in bringing down slavery there. Okay, so just to sum up then, <clears throat> northern troops would not have enforced the Emancipation Proclamation in northern slave states, right? Well, it didn't have any effect. In, it didn't have any effect. It didn't okay. even apply to the northern okay. slave states. And then so. here's, a, here's a very good question. What would have happened to escaped slaves who ended up in a northern slave state? Would they be re-enslaved? In a northern, ah, oh, yes, very important point. Now, technically, legally, slaves from the Confederacy, if they say they went into Kentucky, and this did happen, some fugitive slaves, say from Alabama, who had been with Union troops when there was a Confederate offensive in late 1862, there's a Confederate offensive into Kentucky, and the Union troops had been in Tennessee and northern Alabama retreated back into Kentucky to pursue those troops. And with them, in their train, were large numbers of fugitive slaves who were entitled to freedom. This was before the Emancipation Proclamation, but they were entitled to freedom under the Second Confiscation Act, uh, which had been passed by Congress. Once in Kentucky, Kentuckians, um, if they could capture those freed slaves, they regarded them as escaped slaves and jailed them advertised for their masters to reclaim them. And when their masters didn't show up, not too surprisingly, since the masters are down in Alabama, they then sold them into slavery to new owners in Kentucky. So here were slave people who had become free under the Second Confiscation Act, but were re-enslaved in Union, Kentucky. Now the Union Army um, interrupted that trade and then liberated those people from the jails. But um, it does show you, show you that in the border slave states, slave owners remain deeply committed to slavery. That is, they oppose the change in union in union policy. Okay, well, shall we move on? I want to alert our participants that we're probably going to go a bit over this morning, so please bear with us. So let's you move know, ahead then, Leslie. Your, your good questions have slowed us down, but that's good. That's right. All right, now we introduce black soldiers. I'll point out to you that in the readings, we didn't have time to include them, you have some um, docu WPA interviews with, with uh, black men who had been soldiers. And there's also some photographs that are um, described as being, uh, they're from the Library of Congress, that are described as being African-American soldiers, but actually only some of them are soldiers. And if you go to those images, the left-hand column are soldiers, the right-hand are laborers, not soldiers. That means you could use the ones in the right-hand column as illustrations for those earlier documents we've been using about escaped slaves as Union military laborers. Um, there's also a document that we haven't included here that's about the Battle of Millican's Bend, one of the earliest military engagements in which black soldiers participated. So some of you may want to use it. It's an example of black soldiers who were put into the field with very little training but fought valiant, valiantly in a conflict that culminated in hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's a very vivid uh, battle scene that some of your students may find of use. Now, this document, uh, the one before us now, is also an account of a battle in which black soldiers participated. Uh, these were Kentucky black soldiers at the Battle of Saltville, Virginia, which is in the farthest west part of Virginia, the part that's the counties of Virginia that are actually south of what's now West Virginia. So several important points that we won't read the whole of this because it's too long. The first description is these were black cavalry troops and they are um, on their way to Saltville along with white troops. 
And on the way, the black soldiers encounter jeers and taunts from the white soldiers. Um, pet and petty outrages, he says, like pulling off the caps of the black soldiers. So the white soldiers are not very respectful of the black soldiers on the way there. Uh, but then he says that these insults, as well as the jeers and taunts that they would not fight, were borne by the colored soldiers patiently or punished with dignity by their officers. But in no instance did I hear colored soldiers make any reply to insulting ang uh, language used toward them by the white troops. <coughs> Excuse me. So then they reached the salt works, the Confederate salt works, which were their object, <coughs> and they found the enemy in full force. I've got to take a sip of water. All right, then there's a little descript a description of the battle that ensued. Um, and it shows the, um, uh, the, the black troops rushed on the Confederate works and after a desperate struggle carried the entire line, killing and wounding a large number of the enemy <coughs> and capturing some prisoners. And he uh, goes on to say more about their performance in the battle. Now, on the return after the battle, this is the bottom of this slide, on the return of the forces, those who had scoffed at the colored troops on the march out were silent. So there, in that one sentence, it captures the way that the service of black soldiers earned the respect of white soldiers who previously hadn't been very um, respectful of the black soldiers. Now, this document also provides evidence about the Confederate treatment of black troops, particularly if black soldiers were captured by Confederate forces in battle. Um, so let's read this part. Nearly all the wounded, that is of the, the uh, black soldiers and white soldiers, Union soldiers, nearly all the wounded were brought off, though we had not an ambulance in the command. The Negro soldiers preferred present suffering to being murdered at the hands of a cruel enemy. I saw one man riding with his arm off, another shot through the lungs, and another shot through both hips. Such of the colored soldiers as fell into the hands of the enemy during the battle were brutally murdered. The Negroes did not retaliate, but treated the rebel wounded, the captured, the captured uh, Confederate soldiers, with great kindness carrying them water in their canteens and doing all they could to alleviate the sufferings of those whom the fortunes of war had placed into their hands. So official Confederate policy with respect to captured black soldiers was that they would not be recognized as prisoners of war. Uh, instead, they were to be viewed as insurrectionary slaves, which could mean uh, return to their owners or execution. Now, this was an, a Confederate policy that in the end, probably you can say backfired against the Confederacy. Because for black troops, what it meant is that they knew that to be captured by the Confederates was to either be killed or re-enslaved. And so they fought, if anything, more fiercely. Um, they went into battle with the slogan, Remember Fort Pillow, which was another place where black soldiers were, um, were murdered as, after they'd surrendered. And it caused them to uh, fight even more fiercely because they knew that to be captured was to lose their lives. Any questions about that? So we can use this both about the effect of the service of black men on their fellow white soldiers and extrapolate that to the northern public, because as reports of their service reached the north, many white northerners also began to gain respect for um, people of African descent that they had previously thought would not fight courageously. Now, we need to think as well about the effect of black military service on the families of black soldiers. And this document is in Kentucky. Um, it's an affidavit by a woman whose husband was one of the black soldiers killed at the Battle of Saltville. And so she, um, she testifies, uh, I am a widow and belong to Warren Wiley of Woodford County, Kentucky. My husband, Julius Leach, was a member of Company D, 5th U.S. Colored Cavalry, and was killed at the Salt Works, Virginia, about six months ago. 
Now, one thing to notice in Kentucky, um, many slave holdings were small, and so notice that she and her husband had been owned by different owners. When he, my husband, her husband, when he enlisted sometime in the fall of 1864, he belonged to Sarah Martin Scott, Sarah Martin of Scott County, Kentucky. He'd only been about a month in the service when he was killed. About three weeks after my husband enlisted, a company of colored soldiers passed our house, and I was there in the garden and looked at them as they passed. My master had been watching me, and when the soldiers had gone, I went into the kitchen. My master followed me and knocked me to the floor senseless, saying as he did so, you've been looking at them darn nigger soldiers. When I recovered my senses, he beat me with a cowhide. When my husband was killed, my master whipped me severely, saying my husband had gone into the army to fight against white folks, and he, my master, would let me know that I was foolish to let my husband go. He would take it out of my back. He would kill me by piecemeal and he hoped that the last one of the nigger soldiers would be killed. He whipped me twice after, after that using similar expressions. One thing I should have pointed out before beginning to read this is if you use this document with your students, you have to talk first about the language you're going to encounter. She's quoting what her master said, and he used very ugly language. Um, some students will also be very troubled by the evidence of the violence against her of the extent of the whippings. So I would advise you to talk a little in advance about what they're going to encounter in this document. But it does provide great evidence of how alarmed slave owners were and how infuriated they were by the enlistment of black men in the service. Often, if they couldn't take it out on the men, then they took it out on their families. So. This black man played, paid a price for enlisting. He lost his life within just a few weeks, but so did his wife. Um, there was a heavy price paid. Um, but this document also is a reminder of the importance, the, particular, the special role that black enlistment played in Union slave states like Kentucky. It was absolutely central in weakening slavery where slaves were not entitled to freedom under the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, any, anything? No, I think people have been noting okay. the, the violence of the piece and how mm -hmm. this could be used very effectively with students, even with the, the delicate language. Oh, good. Um, it is, it is a little difficult to navigate. <laughs> it is, it is. So shall we move on then? Okay. All right. Now, again, this is a very long document that can bear very close reading, and it, you can use it for close reading exercises. This is a petition from uh, black people in Nashville, Tennessee, to a unionist convention that was meeting in January 1865 uh, to consider emancipation by state action. So this is a, a convention of white unionists in Tennessee. <coughs> and they are petitioning uh, for emancipation, and then going beyond that to argue that the suffrage should be extended, voting should be extended to black men. So one of the things this document does is illustrate how black military service served as the foundation for claims for full citizenship. I can quite safely generalize and say that from the time black men were enlisted in the Union Army on, well through Reconstruction, almost no appeal for equality for citizenship failed to mention the service of black men in the Union Army. As this became the claim, we fought for the, the nation, we deserve equality in this nation. We fought for the nation. We deserve to be democratic participants in the nation. But they also, in the petition, have beautiful language outlining the meaning of freedom and the fundamental rights of that should belong to all mankind. So let's look just at some of the highlighted uh, parts. Your petitioners would ask you to complete the work begun by the nation at large and abolish the last vestige of slavery by your organic law. And I should add that the convention did do that. They uh, uh, passed an ordinance of emancipation. We hold that freedom is the natural right of all men, which they themselves have no more right to give or barter away 
than they have to sell their honor, their wives, or their children. Uh, paragraph five uh, is about that we, African Americans, have sided with the Union. We didn't have many resources to give to the Union, but we have devoted our hopes, our toils, our whole heart, our sacred honor, and our lives. We will work, pray, live, and if need be, die for the Union as cheerfully as ever a white patriot died for his country. The color of our skin does not lessen in the least degree our love either for God or for the land of our birth. So here's an African-American claim to, to be patriots loyal to the Union. And then here's basing it on Union service, Union military service. Nearly 200,000 of our brethren, and that's an accurate total of the number of black men who served in the Union Navy. Near 200,000 of our brethren are today performing military duty in the ranks of the Union Army. They should have said Navy, too. Thousands of them have already died in battle or perished by a cruel martyrdom for the sake of the Union, and we are ready and willing to sacrifice more. But what higher order of citizen is there than the soldier, or who has a greater trust confided to his hands? If we are called on to do military duty against the rebel armies in the field, why should we be denied the privilege of voting against rebel citizens at the ballot box? The latter is as necessary to save the government as the former. So here's the, the long-standing association in American history of military service and citizenship is being mobilized here by former slaves to say that we're entitled not only to freedom, but to full citizenship. Um, we, there's, that paragraph eight suggests, now it might, not, might sound shocking to call for citizenship, but remember that at first people were shocked by the idea of recruiting black men as soldiers, and look how well that's worked out. They're trying to reassure uh, white Tennesseans that suffrage is maybe not such a radical idea after all. And then the ninth paragraph, the government has asked the colored man to fight for its preservation and gladly has he done it. It can afford to trust him with a vote as safely as it trusted him with a bayonet. And here again, we have we have set this up for close reading. So if you wanted to use that petition, you could take the petition from the presentation and here are some close reading text specific questions that would allow you to use that in class. Probably not going to have time to look at all of these, but but uh, we urge you to use it and uh, feel free to uh, plunder that uh, slide. Because it certainly, you know, their own definition of citizenship and uh, what what a democracy uh, requires uh, are also embedded throughout. And now, this testimony allows you to, to think, have your students think about uh, what about slaves who were deep within the Confederacy, had absolutely no opportunity to flee the Union lines? Uh, what, if anything, could they do and did do, did they do to assist the Union? Um, this is another piece of testimony before that post-war Southern Claims Commission that I mentioned earlier. Um, but he's talking about events that took place in uh, 1864 and very early 1865 in uh, coastal South Carolina, near Georgetown, South Carolina. Um, so Alonzo Jackson, uh, who was born a slave, so he's in his mid-50s at the time of the events he's describing. Um, let me just summarize some of this. All right. So he describes in this document three episodes, three separate episodes in which he assisted escaped Union prisoners of war, who all of whom, each of whom had escaped from the Confederate prison camp at Florence, South Carolina. Now, Florence is a good at least 70 miles as the crow flies from Florence to uh, the Georgetown area. So these are, and Florence was a camp for uh, captured Union, Union soldiers who were enlisted men, not all officers. So these are enlisted men who had on their own managed to escape from the Florence camp and make their way uh, toward the coast. And then they encountered Alonzo Jackson. So here's the first episode. Um, he was loading uh, wood on a flatboat about 30 or 40 miles from Georgetown. And three white men came near the boat. And as soon as they saw that, that we were black men, they came to the boat and said, we're Yankee soldiers. We've escaped from the rebel stockade in Florence. 
we are your friends and can't you do something for us? We're nearly perished. And he knew they were Union soldiers by their, their clothing. Because I invited them to come on the boat and told them I would hurry and cook food for them, which I did, and get to them in my boat. And then he talks about the precautionary steps he took. He immediately pulled away from the landing, went to an area where they couldn't be seen. He says they were very weak. They didn't have any weapons. They didn't have shoes. They were barefoot. It was in the winter, and they were cold. But the Yankees did not su suggest anything for me to do except to feed them, and they wanted to get to the Union gunboats. But they didn't know where the Union gunboats were. And then Johnson, I like this. He's very, uh, he says, they didn't know where the gunboats were. I did. And I told them I would take them where they could get to the gunboats unmolested. I hid the three soldiers in my flatboat and started down the river toward George, Georgetown. It took three days because they have to float at night. So it took three days. He's hiding them in their boat, in his boat the whole time. And then they finally came to North Island, which is about 12 miles from Georgetown, which I, he knew was in possession of Union forces. And so he then had the, men, the soldiers get off the Union soldiers and pointed them the direction to go. Two months later, he had two other escaped Union soldiers um, who, who, um, whom he also helped get to the same place. Now, these soldiers, when he encountered them, they didn't approach him, but he saw them, and he called to them saying there's no danger for, because they were running away. They came nearer and asked me if I was a friend to them, that they were Yankee soldiers who had escaped from rebel prison. I replied that I was as good a friend as ever they had in their lives. And then he took them on his boat and again ferried them down to North Island. Third episode was in February 1865. There he found four escaped soldiers who had escaped from Florence. I fed and took them towards North Island, but it told them it might not be necessary as the Yankees were then probably at Georgetown. And indeed they were. The, by, at that moment, February 1865 is when Union forces took Georgetown. So here is a great example uh, of a slave who stayed within, who's within Union li uh, Confederate lines the whole time, but he's assisting escaped uh, Union prisoners, um, and he did so at the dan in danger of his own life. He said, "I talked with a few white men at Georgetown." and with such colored men as I could trust in favor of the Union all the time during the war. But I knew my life would be taken if it was known how I really felt about the war. Um, he points out to the commissioners that every time he, he didn't have to help those escape Union uh, uh, prisoners of war. I could every time have avoided bringing the, Union, so the Yankee soldiers to North Island and could have caused their arrest if I'd wished to do so on my way to North Island. So those, he helped them at the risk of his own life, and they put their lives in his hands. It's also, in, and there are many, many, many stories of Union POWs who escaped the camps and were assisted by slaves. This is a widespread story. Um, so y Union soldiers came to believe that um, almost any black person in the South would be their friend and would, would help them. Again, we've set this up for close reading. If you want to use uh, Jackson's testimony, here are some questions. Please feel free to plunder the PowerPoint. Use them in your classes. Okay. We're, time is very short, so we should move on. This document helps uh, corroborate that Alonzo Jackson's actions were not atypical. This is a report by two Union prisoners of war who, who had escaped and uh, they described spending two whole months in Charleston, South Carolina, hiding, being kept in hiding by uh, free blacks and slaves who harbored them and by German immigrants who were unionists. So it provides evidence about a secret networks of African Americans and white unionists who operated against the, the Confederacy. I think in the interest of time, I won't read this one, but if you read it, you'll see uh, black families that hid them in their homes, of course, at enormous danger to themselves. This is Charleston. This was in Charleston, South Carolina, the heart of the Confederacy, but they hid them in their own homes for months, and then uh, German immigrants who helped them escape through, through the lines. I'll wait a moment to see if there are any questions. 
Uh, but I think you can use this uh, both to introduce that there were also some white Unionists within the South and that some of them collaborated with uh, slaves. But again, we have un escaped Union prisoners who trusted uh, free blacks and slaves to be on their side and to hide them and to help them, and that they did so um, at uh, the risk, of course, of, uh, of execution had they been caught helping these uh, union POWs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, mm -hmm. this document could be used in class. If you were going to use Alonzo Jackson's testimony, one of the questions you'd ask would be, how could the um, commissioners and the Southern Commission co uh, corroborate mm -hmm. uh, Jackson's testimony? And this is one of the documents you could use with your students and ask them, does this corroborate or contradict? And so that would be one good way to get them to ask uh, penetrating questions about both documents. Oh, that's a that's a good thought, and the, the, there's lots. As I said, there's lots of testimony from um, escaped Union POWs that attest to the assistance they received from from slaves. Uh, this another piece of testimony before the Southern Claims Commission. That's by a woman. Uh, there's less testimony by women, so this is very valuable. And she's a woman who was held in slavery throughout the war in a part of Georgia where she couldn't escape to Union lines. And so it provides, it's too long to read too, but it provides evidence both about the burdens that slaves uh, experience as a result of the war. Um, let's see, toward the bottom, it's talking about, um, let's see, I, she said, I was served mighty mean before the Yankees came here. I was nearly frostbitten. My old missus made me weave to make clothes for the soldiers till 12 o'clock at night and I was so tired, and my own clothes I had to spin overnight. I had to work for the rebels until the very last day when they took us. So she's, as a slave, one of her assignments is to make clothes for Confederate soldiers, and her, her mistress makes her stay up till midnight at night to do that work. So those the slaves within the Confederacy bore heavy burdens um, assigned them by their owners. But she also talks about the ways that um, she's a good example of people who have the least opportunities to directly help the union, the things she did. One thing she and her husband did was, again, help an escaped union Yankee prisoners. This is on the third line of the text. There was a Yankee prisoner that got away and came to our house at night. We kept him hid in my house a whole, full, full, a whole day. He sat in my room. White people didn't visit our house then. <laughs> That's kind of an interesting remark. My husband slipped him over to a man named Joel Hodges, and he conveyed him off so that he got home. Now, Joel Hodges was a white unionist in the area, pretty rare in that area, but he turns up in a lot of the testimony. So again, here in a rural area, uh, you have this white unionist Joel Hodges in cahoots with slaves who are helping escaped union POWs. Um, but she then talks about the danger that she and her husband faced in harboring this escaped uh, prisoner. The white people came hunting this man that we kept overnight. My old master sent one of his own grandsons, and he said if he found it, that they must, that if, that if he found it, that they must put my husband to death. And I had to tell a story to save life. My old master would have had him killed. He was bitter. I told him I had seen nothing of him. I did this to save my husband's life. Now, the other thing that they did to help was assist rebel Confederate deserters. So some of the rebel soldiers deserted and came to our house, and we fed them. They were opposed to the war and didn't own slaves and said they would rather die than fight. Those who were poor white people who didn't own slaves were some of them Union people. I befriended them because they were on our side. I didn't know that he ever did, he, meaning her husband, did anything more for the Union. We were way back in the country, but his heart, his heart was right and so was mine. So another way that slaves deep in the Confederacy could undermine the Confederacy was by assisting Confederate deserters who were in hiding from the Union, from the Confederate authorities. All right, I'm getting tired. I'm sure all of you must be too, but I'll wait for a moment to see if there are any questions. What do we have some, uh, the questions here relate to the burdens slaves 
ex- were, that were placed on them during the war. Um, you can relate this to Alonzo Jackson's testimony by pointing out that um, here's here's another here's a slave couple that harbored an escaped uh, prisoner of war, and it also relates to that Charleston document by showing a network, a connection of uh, slaves with white unionists deep within Confederate territory. And we have we have one point here that's mm-hmm. just been asked okay. about. Uh, it'd be interesting to learn how the African Americans learned of the white sympathizers, and I think we should note that these were small geographical areas, right? Mm-hmm. And people yes. knew everybody, mm-hmm. so you, you're very familiar with each other. Uh, and I, that um, Joel Hodges, who's mentioned, um, several ex-slaves who testified before the Southern Claims Commission, uh, Commission mentioned him. He actually seems to have been about the only white unionists right in their area, but they all knew that he was a unionist and um, that he uh, could help uh, help get um, uh, escape P- Union POWs out of the area. So I think that they, they knew who was who locally, although there's always risk. They'd have to tread carefully till they were sure, um, but uh, there's enough testimony to suggest that in some places uh, quite... Um, sturdy networks developed during the war of slaves and white unionists working against the Confederacy. Mm-hmm. We have a good question here that mm-hmm. I'd ask you to respond to briefly. Okay. How much did the presence of Union soldiers ease the life of slaves? Well, it depends on what you mean by presence. If, um, if you mean if the slaves escaped into Union lines, then they're free. And of course, that that's their avenue to freedom. If, if for people who were enslaved and Union forces were nearby and their owners were afraid they would run away to Union lines, in some ways those slaves had miserable experiences because the Confederate authorities and their own masters would redouble efforts. Their stories of masters who would take away their slaves' shoes and clothing at night so that they to make it harder for them to run away. Um, many slave owners who were near Union lines, uh, once widespread slave escapes were going on to prevent their slaves from escaping, many of them removed their slaves deeper into the interior of the Confederacy. This process was called refugeeing their slaves. So they, to prevent their running away, they would take either all their slaves or at least the able-bodied men uh, deeper into Confederate territory so that they couldn't uh, run away, and particularly after the Union began recruiting black soldiers, they didn't want their slaves being used against them as soldiers. So, and sometimes the proximity of Union troops could uh, reduce slaves' opportunities to become free uh, by um, causing their removal deeper into slavery. Okay, well, shall we move ahead and okay. wrap things up? All right, here's our final document. Um, which is two letters from a black soldier named Spotswood Rice. He was from Missouri. One of the letters is to his two daughters who are still held in slavery, and the other to the woman named Kitty Diggs, who was the owner of one of the daughters. And this document is just, uh, my students are just blown away by this one. Uh, Again, it's written by someone who has uh, not a lot of formal education, but beautifully written, but it is remarkable testimony to the psychological transformation that someone who had been a slave experienced by serving in the Union Army, by being part of uh, an army that was now an army of liberation, by being uh, representing a nation which was now moving directly against slavery. So let me read a bit of this. First, he writes to his, his daughters. My children, I take my pen in hand to write you, to write you a few lines, to let you know that I've not forgot you and I want to see you as bad as ever. Don't be uneasy, my children. I expect to have you. If digs don't give you up, this government will, and I feel confident that I will get you. Your Miss Kitty said that I tried to steal you, but I'll let her know that God never intended for man to steal his own flesh and blood. I once thought that I had some respect for them, meaning slave owners, but now my respects is worn out and have no sympathy for slave owners, slaveholders. And as for her Christianity, I expect the devil has such in hell. 
Oh, my dear children, how I do want to see you. And then he writes, that's not enough. He writes to the mistress who owned one of his daughters. I received a letter from Caroline telling me that you say I tried to steal, to plunder my child away from you. Now, I want you to understand that Mary is my child, and she's a God-given right of my own, and you may hold on to her as long as you can, but I want you to remember this one thing, that the longer you keep my child from me, the longer you will have to burn in hell and the quicker you'll get there. For we're now making up about 1,000 black troops to come up through and want to come through Glasgow. And when we come, woe be to Copperhead rebels and to the slaveholding rebels, for we don't expect to leave them there, to leave them there, root nor branch. But we think, however, that we that have children in the hands of you devils, we will try your virtues the day that we enter Glasgow. Now look how long that sentence is. <laughs> he's, he's clearly building up in his anger. Now you call my children your property. Not so with me. My children is my own, and I expect to get them. And when I get ready to come after Mary, I will have brought a power and authority to bring her away and to execute vengeance on them that holds my child. You'll then know how to talk to me. I'll assure that. And you will know how to talk right, too. I have no fears about getting Mary out of your hands. This whole government gives cheer to me, and you cannot help yourself. Isn't this a stunning description of what the new empowerment that he feels by being part of the Union Army, a new confidence that he's going to get his children out of slavery and that the policy of the government is behind him. So you can use this to think about the transformations, the personal and public transformations that emancipation and in particular black military service had brought about. This man had been fundamentally changed by his military service and he now has confidence that slavery is on his way, his way out and that he will get his children. My students often ask, did he get his daughters? And ordinarily we wouldn't know the documents frequently just dead end. We don't have any idea. But in, this is a very rare and wonderful instance in which in the 1930s, when the Works Progress Administration, a New Deal agency, was interviewing elderly ex-slaves. Believe it or not, one of the elderly ex-slaves they interviewed was Cora, one of his daughters. And she told the story of her father running away, serving, enlisting as a Union Army, trying to get them out of slavery. And indeed, the family was reunited, not until the end of the war, but they were reunited. And Spotswood Rice became a clergyman, became a minister, and she describes their lives together. So it's nice to know that the outcome was the reunification of this family. Uh, <clears throat> one question, is there, uh, do we know if Spotswood Rice wrote this letter himself or did he dictate it? Any way to know that? There's really no way to know. It's clearly, he's clearly not, if he is dictating it, he's not, dicta he's probably not dictating it to a white person who's more literate. He's either writing it himself or some fellow black soldier who has a degree of literacy is doing so. He wrote it while he was in the hospital. He was hospitalized in St. Louis at the time. So I guess he had time on his hands and um, got a letter from um, uh, another daughter, or it might have been his sister, Caroline, saying that um, uh, the Diggses were saying that he tried to steal his children. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't know directly whether this is written in his own hand or by a fellow black soldier, but no. clearly not clearly by someone who's newly literate or, or barely literate. One thing I might point out is that one, one thing that black soldiers gained in military service was often their first acquaintance with literacy because there were schools um, in the black regiments. Um, so many black soldiers gained their first access to literacy uh, while in the military service. Okay, we have one final question. Where does he get his confidence or empowerment? And I guess we could say from his successful service in the mm -hmm. Union Army, right? I think that as well as the knowledge that now the Union government's policy was wow. to destroy slavery. Right. So when he says this whole government gives me cheer, uh, he feels that the tide has turned. You slaveholders cannot help yourself.
and, and he's on the victorious side. Well, mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our seminar. In fact, we've gone a good deal over it. Are there any questions remaining? Any, any last questions that we'd like to pose uh, here before we wrap things up? Okay, I don't see any coming in, so let me remind you to use the form to continue the discussion. Uh, we'll monitor the form up until July 19th, which means that if uh, interesting questions or comments come in over the transom, we'll pass them along to Professor Rowland, and we'll get back to you on, on that. In the meantime, please submit your evaluations and check out our fall 2012 seminars. And before we wrap up, I want to thank all of our participants for your intelligent and enthusiastic and energetic participation. That's why we've run over 15 minutes. And I want to thank Leslie for giving us an excellent seminar. Thank you very much. From the comments, you're going to have an impact on the way this material is taught. So thank you, Leslie. Well, I, it was a real pleasure. And I know from my own experience that these documents just work beautifully in the classroom. So I hope you enjoy using them as I do. Well, they certainly will play into the Common Core Standards and help our teachers implement those in their classes. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, I want to thank you, and I want to remind you that you can escape from the classroom by going up to the upper left-hand corner of your screen, clicking on File. There'll be a drop-down menu saying Leave Session. Click on that, and you're home free. I hope you'll join us for some more seminars in the fall. Until then, have a good summer. Good day. Leslie, I thought that went very well. Oh, good. I'm I'm scrolling back, looking at the chat. That um, was very good. Uh, mm -hmm. I I noted one a comment from Melissa Gillespie. She wrote, "I wish I was in the classroom right now with students." I saw that. I saw so that. I think that I think that indicates that we we hit a home run here. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. That was a model seminar, as far as I'm concerned. Oh, as great. Far as 
t- teaching people how to use. I see some great ideas here, like one of them talking about using the uh, that Nashville petition yeah. during Constitution Week. And you know, I I kick myself for failing to mention that language in the Declaration of Independence yeah. that appears in it. But yeah. they noticed it, so that's yeah. good. Yeah. It also um, echoes the Gettysburg Address. Uh, That's right. Oh, it uses both. Yeah, yeah. we should have pointed that out. Yeah, the echoes Gettysburg. Might add that, you know, because you gave, you did additional questions for yeah. it that <clears> have to do with, um, oh, because it's, uh, pers- it's a persuasive document, but the analysis, it might be worth putting that among the Yeah. The and question. the question in there about what 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 documents does it echo and why? Oh, okay, yeah. all right. Well, I'm sorry that I didn't say that. Oh well, uh, that's fine. They'll they'll, mm-hmm. they'll, get, they'll have it. Mm-hmm. No, it was a great seminar, and uh, I noticed that one of the participants reported on the Supreme Court ruling, and they just used one word, upheld. So I don't oh, know. Oh, really? Means. Oh, yeah. That's I don't I don't know what the details are, but that may uh, mean that the whole health care law was upheld. It, it could. I'm what a surprise. We'll all go online and find out. Oh, well, but, that's interesting. Uh, yes, okay. you've, you've done service oh, above and beyond here. We kept okay. you on a lot longer. So thank you very well, I much. I hope they didn't mind. But I, I also like the, some of these we're talking about using these in literature classes. Yes, yeah, I saw that. This and one person nice. had a really good idea to use the first letter you start with in comparison with the second, with the letter you end with. Mm-hmm. And those two, I think, juxtaposing those two, would I think be... What, uh, the transformation that had occurred? Yeah. 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 Very yeah. good. Well, well, if I stay here and read the rest of the chat, it does it mess up anything? And then no, I'll just no, no, exit no. I'll, file. No, okay. Not at all. Not at all. I'll I'll keep it on, and then when I see your name disappear, then I'll shut down the seminar. In the meantime, though, I'll thank you again and uh, let you know that we'll be back. Uh, we're going to re- redo this seminar if you'd be willing to repeat it for us at some time. And I'll, okay. I am going to try to call some of these documents out for our America in class lessons. And again, at some point. Uh, we're we're pretty our schedule is pretty full for next year, but at some point I'd like to talk to you about uh, working up some other seminars uh, yeah. like this one. Well, one that I immediately can think of, and that the teachers seem interested in it, because I sort of thought this one was going to be. I think you could do a whole one that's about like military service in the yeah. Civil War. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's about, good. and then and then include some documents about the experiences of men within the army, the yeah. pay discrimination issue, and duty, and some battle. But the whole debate about recruiting black soldiers, and you still might want to end with spots with rice. <laughs> yeah, you might. You know, it that actually uh, would be a good theme. You could trace that same theme through the Revolution, the Civil mm-hmm. War, the First World War, the Second World War, Vietnam. Mm-hmm. You because I mean, it's mm-hmm. that that theme. Oh, if we serve in the war, we will show white America that we're loyal citizens and competent and brave and are deserving of full citizenship, right. but of course it never works out that way. Well, and it also a- raises that question that it's kind of perverse that we don't think people are entitled to equality until they die, have to yeah. die. Yeah. People have to be willing yeah. to, you know, there's a kind of the demand that only if you're willing to die, uh, yeah. then you're sort of, if white Americans get forced to recognition at least in theory of uh, but anyway yeah there was, okay, the same, well, there was a piece on, on news last night about the montford point marines the black the yeah. first black marine regiment oh yeah mm-hmm. finally given um oh they got a congressional medal of honor or something mm-hmm. something like that yeah mm-hmm. and uh, they were interviewing one of the survivors one of the he was 90 years old and he was saying yes we felt that if we served uh that would put an end to jim crow well yeah <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, but it okay. did serve as a foundation for making a case that you can. I mean, it's harder to de- it's harder to keep denying yes. rights when people have fought, you know, have demonstrated their patriotism. So, uh, but it is a kind of sad commentary on what uh, you would think people would be entitled to that just on the basis of being human beings, but. Uh, right. More right. exacted. Okay, I'll. I'm going to look through the rest of the okay. chat before I'll, I'll I keep, exit. I'll keep the room up, and then when I check back, if, if I see that you've uh, you've exited, then I'll just shut things down. But in okay. the meantime, I'll leave it up. And thank you once again for an excellent seminar. Well, you're welcome. It always just the time flies for me, and then I look at how long it's been. been. <laughs> but they seemed engaged throughout. Yeah, so. We didn't lose a single person. Mm-hmm. In the overtime, oh, we didn't lose a single person. So, how many uh, people were there? I forgot to ask. Uh, forty-one. 41. Okay. 41. Very good. Good moment.
Uh, well, I'm okay. glad there was so much North Carolina material. That was total yeah. accident, but it yeah. works well for them. So. It does. It does. Uh, okay. Well, thanks, Richard. Thanks again. Bye-bye. It's been a pleasure. Mm -hmm.